Hi folks, it's James. How's it going? Got something impressive to show you. Um, look at that. This is uh, Spin Cleaner Washer Fluid Mark III solution and I've been struggling to find a bottle of it. Uh, I bought the record cleaner a while ago, you know, the yellow machine, and one of the things I was concerned about was I wasn't going to be able to find replacement fluid and it seemed like there was loads about at the time so I bought the machine and now it's impossible to find this stuff so thanks to uh, Andy at Cloudy Milder who um, gave me a link to somewhere where I could buy a bottle so that should see me through now uh, for the next um, a couple of years wonderful okay so in the background just got a bit of canned heat got it on quite quiet because I don't want to get into trouble um, so yeah hope you're all well and um, I'm back for another vinyl update now I'm meant to be doing part two of my 80s uh, haul 80s uh, records that I found but I'm gonna I'm gonna sidetrack a little bit and talk about um, a big haul of records that I've found in an antiques fair antiques mall quite near my house you'd have seen already hopefully I uploaded a video showing my adventures into the labyrinth so I'm going to show you the stuff I bought at the Antiques Fair and uh, there's some stuff which is maybe a bit more kind of goodwill and then it gets kind of more interesting later on. This is a nice record uh, that I was pleased to pick up because I have nothing by Peggy Lee. Uh, this is just the best of Peggy Lee. And um, what a voice, yeah. I, I kind of didn't know much about her. I know Graham Watson at Cracking Vinyl is very into her. Uh, this is on... Uh, Orange Capital and uh, she sort of reminds me a little bit of a female Ray Charles in the sense that she seems to be able to cover all bases you know she's at home with the blues she can do pop uh, she can do country stuff she can do jazz really versatile so delighted to find that that was three pounds you can see here it says the office on it at this antiques place there's loads of different little rooms and stalls and none of them are actually uh, manned they've got CCTV on the ceiling and each place has its own kind of um, name that goes on here. So basically you get all your stack together, take it to the front desk and they just write down um, who the payment is to go to. So quite interesting, never quite seen it done that way before. Uh, this one, again from the office, this is uh, Get Happy by Ella Fitzgerald. And uh, this is in mono, beautiful copy of that. I've only got a couple of Ella records in the collection, so it was nice to find this one. This is, oh, okay, his master's voice. Beautiful old label. I used to live, I used to live in a house where the landlord uh, had a bedroom upstairs that was kind of out of bounds. He didn't live there, but right at the very top of the house, he had this room that was, you know, full of his stuff. And on the landing outside, he had one of those uh, big horn old record players, what are they called? Anyway, yes, always glad to find Ella Fitzgerald in uh, good condition, so delighted to find that. Uh, uh, okay, this one was just a pound, and I thought of Headley when I found it. Country Roads by Loretta Lynn. Can't go wrong, for a quid. Uh, that one is just on MCA Rainbow. But, uh, there's another one. Uh, I was, okay, I was delighted with this one actually. I love the cover straight away. This is um, the sound of Philadelphia Philly Busters. So this is the Philadelphia label from the 1970s. It's got stuff on it. Well, there's two tracks that I bought the record for. The first one is um, Backstabbers by the OJs, uh, which I absolutely love and Love Train by the OJs as well. Uh, but it's also got some other quite interesting stuff on it. It's got uh, Billy Paul doing Me and Mr. Jones. It's got, okay, it's got Harold Melvin in the Blue Notes doing If You Don't Love Me By Now. Now I can't listen to that song anymore without picturing Ricky Gervais uh, from the British Office. Uh, there's a brilliant thing in the Christmas special of the original Office where he's basically financed himself to make this terrible record and he's doing a cover of that song and it just you know has to be seen to be believed. But... Um, Philly Soul was a lot of it around in the 1970s when I was watching Top of the Pops and I was always quite impatient with it because I was always, you know, 
kind of waiting for the Boontown Rats and Squeeze to come on. But now I feel very nostalgic about this music. It kind of, they've got two sort of basic styles. They've got the very kind of slow, slow burning, smoochy soul stuff, some of which I find a little bit cheesy. Uh, but then some of it is kind of almost Southern soul, but it's just kind of going into disco. And um, I find a lot of it very nice to listen to. It's very uh, orchestral, I suppose. Gamble and Huff, you know, they had their own sound. There's a few tracks on here that I'm not so keen on. There's some very uh, gushy, slushy stuff. There's, there's a track called It's Forever by the Ebenezer, which is just far too sugar sweet and slushy for me. But this does have some good stuff on it as well. I was pleased to grab it. Didn't have any Philly soul on vinyl. I'll show you the label because we don't see enough of the uh, Philly, really. Mm -hmm. Grab this one because I've got all the, I think it's, is it the four or five classic Moody Blues albums from the late 60s going on to the early 70s. I bought this one because I just wanted the song, um, The Voice, uh, this is the Moody Blues. This, I think this came out in 1980. This is Long Distance Voyager. It is quite a nice album. It kind of represents their kind of later sound, which was more poppy, you know, more commercial sounding. I love this cover. I've always looked at this cover in shops and I've never really paid it much attention. But um, the masterstroke that I didn't realise was there. It's an old painting, you know, but they've got this... Um, if you look very f carefully into the sky here, there's a kind of spaceship arriving. I just think that is so great. It just epitomises everything, I think, which is great about um, album art from the 1970s and 80s. Nice album. I've given it a couple of spins and, uh, yeah, I should be keeping it. Like I said, I just wanted that track, The Voice, because uh, I'm very fond of it. It has a nostalgic uh, flavour to it. Love Justin Hayward's voice. You can't go wrong with it in Moody's. Um, right, this next one, an artist that I've heard about and didn't know much about. I have a friend, a very good friend, who I meet up with occasionally and we go for a drink and he loves uh, this guy. Now, I'm not sure how to pronounce it. It's either Bruce Cockburn or Bruce Coburn, I'm not entirely sure. Uh, but he's a Canadian singer-songwriter. This is one of his uh, more successful albums, I think, Stealing Fire. It's got a great cover, isn't it? And uh, there's Bruce on the back. And uh, apparently this does represent his more commercial side. He was a bit, maybe a bit more kind of raw earlier on in his career. And uh, this album, it's got a sort of touch of dire straits about it. Uh, it's got a bit of production, you know, it's slightly, it's kind of a little bit slick. It's got some synths and um, maybe kind of erring slightly too far on the side of that kind of very mannered studio kind of sound. But the songs are good. Lyrically, he's quite political, quite interesting to listen to. My favourite song on this is a great song actually um, called um, If I Had a Rocket Launcher, which I think is a great song. If I had a rocket launcher, I would not have... Um, so there were a couple of other Bruce records there. I should mention actually I've made three trips to this place now um, and um, I've seen some good stuff. I, 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 I've bought a lot of stuff. I'm showing you probably about a third of the stuff that I bought from there. I'll be showing you some other stuff uh, in 2019 as I try and catch up with myself, you know. Anyway, Bruce Cockburn and uh, Stealing Fire. I'm delighted to find this one because I've kind of fallen into collecting Donovan. This is Slow Down World. And this is from 1976. Really good album. I like Donovan. He puts me in a good zone, you know, good space. He's always, he's got this very kind of warm, congenial sound. He's one of those artists that when you listen to his music, you feel like you've kind of entered into his little world. And it's all a bit kind of sparkly and a bit eccentric sounding. And um, he seems to have a consistency, you know, his songwriting seems to be very consistent from what I've heard already. I like his voice, it's kind of shades of Mark Boland coming through and um, he seems like a very versatile artist. Obviously you know he's got his roots in the 1960s in the folk movement, he was friends with the Beatles, he was kind of on the scene at the time. I don't know why it's taken me so long to discover him or to get round to him 
but I'm actually quite excited now because his records seem to be quite uh, readily available and I'm going to pick them up now whenever I see them. So um, just one of those artists that um, I just think to myself, right, great, I've discovered somebody new that's been around for donkey's years that I've never bothered with. Uh, so there we go, that's Donovan and Slow Down World. Okay, next we have an artist whose music I don't really know at all, didn't have any of her records, not on CD, not on record. Again, she's another figure from the 1960s who was absolutely pivotal to the whole story of, you know, British rock and pop, the Stones and all that. This is Marianne Faithful and uh, Dangerous Acquaintances. This album is from uh, 1981. And uh, this is a good album. Her voice, though, her voice is very rough, you know, I mean... You, you couldn't argue she had a great voice at all. She's got a very slightly flat, droney voice, um, which kind of, you know, I like Bob Dylan. I like people who've got what you might describe as non-voices, you know, people who have a non-virtuosic voice. But her, her voice sort of pushes at the edges of my tolerance. You know, sometimes she really does sound like a kind of cackly old um, lady, you know, sometimes. Uh, but uh, the songs are good on this record, it's a keeper, it's in great condition, Island Records. So yeah, I don't know a great deal about Marianne, and uh, I know she's got loads and loads of records, but I mean, judging from her voice, she's not somebody that I'm going to jump into collecting seriously. But I was pleased to find this one, it was only £3, and like I said, the songs are good, the production is good, the playing is good, everything's great, and um, yeah, maybe her voice will grow on me. Okay, inching into the top end of things now, a couple of things I was really delighted to find. Couldn't believe it when I found this. This was five pounds. The Birds' first album, Mr. Tambourine Man. It's the Embassy reissue, but um, I've never seen I've never seen this record in the wild. I don't run across Birds albums ever, really. Uh, I've got one Birds album. I've got the tenth album, which I bought on uh, from eBay. Uh, I did buy a load of uh, Birds albums on CD a while back while I was doing Tommy Burton's contest and since then I, I mean I, I just never see their record so I was so pleased to find this one and what a great album it is I mean I don't need to wax lyrical about it too much but it just has it just has the most wonderful sound you know the birds had their own their own specialized brand of um, kind of feel good jingle jangle edging into psych territory already actually on this first record I love the textures of the guitars, I love the singing, I love the songwriting, I love the uh, the Bob covers, just everything about it. A bit like Donovan, you know, the Birds are a band from the 60s who I should have got round to a lot sooner. Don't really know why I haven't, but um, hopefully I will start to see more of their records as time goes on and I'll be able to start extending the collection a little bit. So yeah, please to find that, £5, Embassy reissue, but you can't, you can't complain, can you really? So there we have the Birds. This one you'll have seen pop up in the video that I made when I was in the shop, if you've have seen that already. Now, I couldn't leave this behind. It was a little bit pricey, £15, but it was in great condition. Uh, this is The Cure, Standing on a Beach, the singles, and uh, this is in really good condition. I don't have any Cure on vinyl at all. I have a fair few albums on CD, and they're a band that I never really got into back in the day, uh, even though I did like them. I think the main reason was their music was everywhere. When I was when I was at college, you know, back in the late 80s, early 90s, you'd, you'd hear the Cure songs everywhere. They just became an absolute staple of my social life. They were on all the college jukeboxes. If you went out to a club, you know, you'd hear Love Cats, you'd hear all those songs. The sound of Robert Smith's voice is just kind of indelibly inside me I, I've just I've known their music for so long uh, but I never really wanted to particularly um, you know buy their stuff or become a fan of theirs I think maybe perhaps it's just one of those bands where they seem to have a very vast catalogue and it's maybe a little bit intimidating uh, and and they're quite expensive you know I mean this one I was willing to fork out the 15 quid for this one I'm not going to start buying Cure albums on vinyl you know shelling out loads of money because I have got a lot of them on CD uh, but I couldn't leave that one behind because it has a lot, you know, I mean it's got it's got some really great stuff on it. Um, the Hanging Garden, uh, Close to Me, um, Boys Don't Cry, just you know some really great, uh, it goes from the kind of early days where it was very skeletal sounding and post-punk and um, yeah uh, it, just a great thing to find and a really great thing to have in the collection. I was so so pleased to find it. Uh, that's the cure. 
And then finally for today, this, this last one um, comes with a twist. So again, if you've watched the video, you'll have seen. It's so funny in the video, I'm just flicking through these records and I say something like, oh, this is just, you know, goodwill stuff. And the second those words have left my mouth, looks like fairly typical goodwill stuff in this box. Blimey. Blimey. This pops up in the racks. Mighty Like a Rose, Elvis Costello from 1991, an album which I've only just got to know on CD this year, and I absolutely love it. This is a fantastic album. Uh, it's got a couple of tracks co-written by Paul McCartney, um, So Like Candy and Playboy to a Man, and I just love So Like Candy. It's just a magnificent song. But the track that really does it for me on this record is Sweet Pear, which sounds a bit like the band, but it just has the most incredible guitar solo. And um, a very full sound on this record. I think he really went to town on it. It's kind of a huge studio you know, Baroque masterpiece. I think his dad is on it somewhere. I think his dad plays a bit of um, brass, is it, or saxophone? Maybe on Invasion Hit Parade? Anyway, to cut a long story short, I, I've i never seen it in the wild. But the strangest thing is, I, I, I bought this copy, and I think it was, it wasn't cheap. It was, I think it was nine pounds. And it's in okay shape, but it's a little bit on the crackly side, but not too bad, but it's, you know, it's a little bit crackly. But then literally, I think it was four or five days later, I was walking through town, walked past Oxfam, and I found a much better copy in the window of Oxfam, and it was cheaper, and it was six pounds. So in the, in the space of a few days, I found two copies of Mighty Like a Rose. So it's kind of, it just goes to show sometimes, you find it, you know, you find a record that you've never seen in the wild. It's maybe a, little, a bit more than, you, than, than you'd want to pay for it, but you buy it anyway, and then a few days later you see another one in better condition, cheaper. But uh, that's just the way things go, isn't it? I mean, I was still pleased to have it, and um, an excellent addition to the collection. So there we go. So I'll leave it there for today. Like I said, I've got lots more to show you from uh, that particular place. There were two other visits, uh, but I'll save those for the new year. So thanks folks, stay tuned, I've got a couple more videos coming up on this channel before Christmas and hopefully at least one video on, uh, on the Beatle James channel as well. So I'll take my leave, hope you're all well and I will see you soon. Bye bye.